Canigliao story is about perseverance in mythology. The Jackie Robinson story is about baseball and civil rights. And the Williams story is really a baseball story. This story, the story about Mo Bird, a former catcher for the Boston Red Sox, is an amazing story. And World War II is full of amazing stories. But the Berg story is just too fantastic to believe. And you have to ask yourself a question. How is it that a 15-year Major League Baseball veteran who's basically a ba backup catcher gets a license to kill from the United States government? It's unheard of. How does that how does that happen? And that's how we start the, uh, our talk tonight, the atomic bomb and the curve ball, the incredible true story of, of Mo Bird. Now, we all know who Ian Fleming is, and he's the fantastic author of the, of the Bond series. And Fleming had worked for Brit Britain's Naval Intelligence Division in World War II, and he writes that spies are trained to keep their mouths shut. They don't often lose the habit. That's why true spy stories are extremely rare. And personally, I have never seen one in print that completely rang true, even in fiction. There was very little good spy literature. And, and really, until Nicholas Davidoff's book, The Catcher Was a Spy, there was very little, little written about Moberg. He kept his secret till the day he died. So as I said, this is first a spy story. And spy stories in American history are nothing new. This is a World War II story. And as I had said, we're on Jackie Robinson, um, the greatest evil in the history of mankind was unleashed and we had to fight that. And many had their roles to play. Finally, this is a baseball story. And how does a journeyman catcher become a major figure in World War II? Does this guy taking a look at this photo, does he stand out in any way? Does he look like a spy? All he is is a second string catcher. And what characteristics would make him qualified to be a spy? And what would give the United States government, give him a license to kill? And tonight, that's what we're here to find out. But who was he? And now does a retired second string catcher for the Red Sox play into this. You know, there are a lot more talented ball players than, than uh, Moberg that served in World War II. Hank Greenberg, Joe DiMaggio. Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr. And you know, how, does, how is the story different? Well, it's a really unique story. And, and if you think about Fleming's quote, which I just read, no one knew about Berg's exploits until he was long dead. And there was a lot of material that was declassified to what Berg did during the war long after he was gone. You know, from a former CIA operative, there was just one part of me, a small part of me, I guess, that wanted something that was a bit abandoned, a bit uncontrolled, almost suicidal, maybe. And maybe this is the thrill. This is the thrill that drives a person to, to do covert operations, to be a spy. Spies in history are nothing new. Um, there's a long history, and the spies have been told since the dawn of man, they have intrigued us and they capture the broad imagination. The spy story makes an average story seem that much more appealing. We're all familiar with Mata Hari, the most famous spy in World War I. She was a Dutch exotic, explore, Dutch exotic dancer and a courtesan who was convicted of being a spy for Germany during World War I. We have Marguerite Harrison, Spied for the U.S. and Russia and Japan, arriving in Russia in 1920 as an Associated Press correspondent. That was her cover. 
She assessed the Bolshevik economic strengths and weaknesses and assisted American prisoners in Russia. For American history, the spy network is nothing new. During the American Revolution, the then American population was saturated with those seeking independence, but also those who were loyal to the King of England. Washington didn't really outfight the British, he out simply outspied us, said Major George Beckwith, British intelligence officer. George Washington understood the value of information and misinformation during, during the war, during wartime. And remember that New York was loaded with loyalists, people loyal to the king. In his defeat in the Battle of Brooklyn, Washington knew that in order to solidify his position, he needed good information and he needed a good network of spies. The great hero, Nathan Hale, who said that, I famously said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Connecticut born Yale educated teacher who was, who was hung, who was captured for being a spy for the Americans. Benjamin Talmadge, American military officer, politician and spy master. Paul Revere, the great hero um, from Massachusetts and Philip Massey, a friend of Thomas Jefferson. He acted as an agent to purchase arms for Virginia during the American Revolution. And the Confederacy. Confederacy had an extensive network of spies. Bell Boyd, best known as Bell Boyd, was a Cleopatra of the Secession and known as the Siren of Shenandoah. Henry Thomas was simply known as Harrison, a spy for, for General James Longstreet. Antonia Ford, a Union office, forces occupied the Fairfax region. Ford circulated among the officers and garnered valuable information for the Confederates. And then Rose O'Neill Greenhouse, she's a renowned Confederate spy, a socialite in DC. She used her connections to pass along key information on military movements to the Confederacy. All part of American history. In popular culture, there's a couple of images of what spies are. The literature has countless stories of spies. And for some reason, there's this kind of sense of romanticism with the spy story. I don't know about you, but I love a good spy story. Austin Powers, The International Man of Mystery, the Powers Trilogy took the spy story and naturally made it comical and flipped it on its head. But the ultimate spy uh, in pop culture is James Bond. Bond story paints a picture of the spy as debonair, sophisticated, with a license to kill. And the Bond character is the quintessential spy. Men wanted to be him, women wanted to be with him. So back to what I had said earlier about this being a World War II story, there are amazing stories about World War II. We know about the Ghost Army. The Ghost Army was a tat tactical deception unit during World War II. And if you take a look at that picture, that man isn't the strongest man on the face of the earth. That tank is actually made to balloon. And you had, they were part of the 23rd headquarters special troops and they were movement. They had tanks, and guns and jeeps and trucks that were allowed to be inflated and they would move them into different directions to throw off the enemy and confuse them. There are 100, 1,100 unit man group known as the Ghost Army. Audie Murphy, the most decorated soldier of World War II at 19 years old, single-handedly held off a company of German soldiers in France in 1945. One of my favorite stories, the the Monuments Men, a true story and actually a very good movie. Um, Hitler, a failed artist, wanted to create the Supreme Führer Museum in Germany and had instructed his troops to requisition and capture or steal all the famous artwork in Europe. And he was gonna create this massive Führer Museum. And these men, think about this. You have allied movements to fight the Germans, the Axis powers. But paralleling that is these gentlemen, these men and women who are going through Europe to find this lost art and preserve it for future generations. A lot of artwork was reco recovered and a lot was not. But again, eventually, 
this is a baseball story. And when Berg was playing in the 20s and 30s, baseball ran supreme. And Berg loved baseball. And baseball allowed him and gave him the access to what he needed, money, travel. He got to go to different locations. And um, he got to understand people and got to travel, which is what he loved. And for him, he was the right man at the right time. And like Dostaki's Bear, I think that we would say that Mo Berg was the most interesting man in the world. And who was Morris Moberg? Um, born in New York, played 15 major league seasons uh, for baseball for four different American League teams. And he was never more than an average baseball player. He was a graduate of uh, Princeton College, Princeton University, and then went on to get an honorary, get a law degree at Columbia University, which was kind of unheard of for um, baseball players back then. He broke in with the uh, Chicago White Sox in 1926. And think about this, so the White Sox who still haven't recovered from the throwing of the 1919 World Series. He was an excellent, excellent student and an excellent standout athlete at Princeton. And in 1929, he ended up hurting his knee and moved off from shortstop and became a catcher, recognizing that that was his place for the future. Played for several series of teams. Um, played for the Brooklyn Dodgers, actually with the Brooklyn Robins, who eventually became the Dodgers. Played for the Senators, the White Sox, the Cleveland Indians, and eventually ended his career playing five years for the Boston Red Sox. And it's interesting from Casey Stengel, um, because Stengel says, now I tell you, I mean, Mo Berg was a smart baseball player ever to come along. Knew his legs wouldn't cooperate in the infield. And when the catching job opened up, he grabs a mask and puts it out on, and there he was. Another guy caught in his life and then goes behind the plate like Mickey Cochran. Now that's something. But I'll tell you again, nobody ever knew his life's history. I call him the mystery catcher, the strangest fellow who ever put on a uniform. Now think about that. He'd done some catching at Princeton. And it's, a, it's, it's an extremely difficult position, the most difficult and most intense position to play on the baseball field. But Berg knew how to do it. And Shock was his manager of the White Sox and there were a couple of catches that got knocked out. And he says, okay, you know what? They needed someone to play catcher and Berg volunteered. And that sustained him for his career. And the catches and the legends of the game during that time are his contemporaries. Ray Shock, Hall of Fame catcher, for the Chicago White Sox. Mickey Cochran, Hall of Fame catcher for both the Philadelphia A's and the Detroit Tigers. The great Bill Dickey, New York Yankee legend. And then uh, Rick Farrell, who was, um, who was catching with the Red Sox and Berg was actually Farrell's uh, backup. And um, these are the men that Berg was matched against, all Hall of Famers. And, um, all excellent baseball players. So where does Berg fit in all this? So as I said, that catching is the most difficult job in the majors. And they say that the catching equipment, and this is the type of equipment Berg would have used back then. If you take a look at the mask, it's not as sophisticated as it is today. A lot have a helmet that protects their head uh, and their ears. The chest protector really hasn't evolved too much. The shin guides now extend over the thigh and onto the toes. And the catches bit is a lot more easier to work. But most importantly is the catcher manages the game. Beyond calling balls and strike, calling the game for the pitcher. He anticipates the movers, he anticipates the movement of the runners on the bases. He sees everything. He observes every play on the field characteristic of a spy. He sees his surrounding. And beyond the fact that he was a good athlete, the fact that he was a good catcher was invaluable. So that's why he had such a long career. And these qualities, his intelligence, his perception of what's transpiring in front of him, his physical and athletic ability, makes him the perfect person to be a spy. The tools of a spy really are cyanide pills, hidden guns, secret messages, and signals. And for most, most spies, um, 
if you are caught by the enemy, um, you'll, ca you'll, you'll do the denial factor and there's the opportunity to maybe carry a cyanide pill. We'll get to that in just a moment. Baseball allowed Berg to travel. And in 1934, um, Berg was chosen to go with the league all-stars from Major League Baseball into Japan. And he was with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox, all the, and Lefty Gomez, all the big stars of, of baseball during that time. And after they played a couple of games, Berg quietly slipped away and went to a hospital, St. Luke's International Hospital, uh, disguised himself as going to see a family friend at the hospital, took his camera, went on the roof, and uh, took film of Tokyo Harbor, where the buildings were, where the ships were, you know, a layout of the harbor. And it would be seven years, seven years before the State Department would take a look at those um, films, which he had sent to them, and then say, wait a minute, we might have something here with this guy. Let's get, bring him in. And, you know, Berg loved culture. And like I said, he loved baseball, and baseball afforded him an opportunity to travel. And he would go to all these different cities, and he would know, he'd, he was a loner. He'd go visit the libraries and the museums and the restaurants and learn stuff. And, you know, by participating in the store, it allowed him naturally to make some extra money. He understood the language. He understood the culture. And um, it was just another aspect of who he was. He was a mystery man, and he knew how just to ingratiate himself into society. And he was the smartest man in the room. And in essence, the catcher is the smartest player on the field. He's managing the game. He's an observer. And what other qualities would you want in a spy? Berg checks the box repeatedly checks the box. Berg was a journeyman catcher, and his last professional stop was with the Boston Red Sox. He played five years there, and he appeared in fewer than 30 games a season. Uh, he was a master storyteller who loved to, who captured the imagination of his, um, of his teammates. And I want to say that about a teammate, Red Sox teammate pitcher Joe Casarella would say, I was very puzzling. Here was this man with a tremendous academic background in a game that didn't call for it. I asked myself numerous times, why would he select the ordinary game of baseball and devote so much time to it? It's a good question. And Berg was a true loner. Um, he was just a different type of baseball player. Read multiple newspapers a day. And his, you couldn't touch a newspaper if you haven't read it yet because the paper to him was still alive. Read different newspapers. Um, liked to visit museums and libraries and took three showers a day and um, didn't really commiserate too much with his teammates. And, you know, Berg saw it all during his 15-year career. And his last season coincided with the rise of the great Red Sox teams. And there's a picture of young Bobby Doerr and then Ted Williams. And Williams would say of Berg that Moe was – only 16, old is the, old, 16 years older than I, but he was much more subdued than the average guy, even at that age. Not a lot of pop, pop and vinegar. And um, Bo didn't play a lot, and he would get up when he was asked to play or to, to pinch it. And he goes, guys, did they still call three strikes in this game? And, then, and make a joke of it. But he saw it all. He played with all the great ball players. He saw Ruth. He saw Gehrig. He saw Fox and Shock and Mickey Crocker and Greenberg, and then saw the rise of Bobby Doerr. And, um, and Ted Williams. So Berg ends his career in 1939, and um, he's, con he's connected with the Princeton alum, and he gets in contact with Major General Donovan and Nelson Rockefeller, and he starts a career with uh, his first stop is the Office of Inter-American Affairs. And Berg knew, he goes, listen, I'm done with baseball. What is the next chapter in my life? But what was really attractive beyond his, his skill as an athlete was that he could speak multiple languages. Now, all told, they say that he could speak 12 languages. He could speak Greek, Spanish, Sanskrit, Japanese, Latin, French, German, and Italian. And this made him extremely unique. In 1939, World War II has already begun. The war started in 36. 
America's entry doesn't happen until 41. So there is definitely a need to find people who are skilled linguists. So you don't only just have the enemy in Germany and the enemy in Japan, it's the other enemies abroad. How about our friends to the South? Where are they going to support? Where do they lie? Where their loyalties lie? And Casey Stengel would say, Mo Berg could uh, speak several different languages and couldn't hit any of them. And all told, Berg played 663 games, had over 1,800 at-bats, lifetime average of 243, six home runs, and uh, 206 RBIs. And safely said he made about $76,000 for a career. And as Casey Stengel said, the, most str the strangest guy he ever met. But when we talk about espionage, Dr. Ursula Wilder from um, her, her paper on the psychology of espionage, people who commit espionage sustain double lives. Separation must be maintained between the person's secret spy identity, which is clandestine, clandestine activities, and the non-spy public self. Wilder was a 16-year veteran of the federal intelligence community. And she claimed that, she states that there are three essential elements that set the condition for a person's entry into espionage. One is the dysfunction of personality. Well, we know that Berg was alone. A state of crisis. Berg had no long time close relationships. Yeah, he lived with his sister and her brother, but it wasn't a good relationship. He didn't have a close relationship with his parents either. In the ease of opportunity to, to jump in, and, and much like when Berg hit, hurts his knee in 1929, he sees an opportunity to, okay, listen, I'm going to uh, prolong my career and have a career in baseball. I don't want competition. Let me go try to be catcher. And there's always a need for a backup catcher. So he seized that opportunity and took the challenge. And, and Berg becomes a spy. A unique talent was it is that he was a great storyteller. And he was, you know, he could speak several languages. He was a top-notch athlete. He was a mystery man and knew how to keep a secret. So he's the ideal candidate to be a spy. So soon he catches the eye of General Donovan. And after his stint with the Inter-American Affairs, he goes to uh, where he's traveled South America and Central America visits Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela, Aruba, Caracao, and Ecuador. And he wants to see who's the loyal allies. He uh, is recruited to officially join the OSS. And the brain, so styled, won't be so, won't be on the business end of anti-graph gun or nipping a Jap warship off for a space with a torpedo. But the kind of work he will be doing will be just as vital, maybe more so, right at this moment. No one knows what Berg is going to do. Nobody. And Berg is just one of many who find uh, an opportunity to do important work at the OSS. General Wild Bill Donovan was a hero of uh, World War I and a Medal of Honor winner. The OSS is the forerunner to the CIA, and he understood that they had to create a network of spies in Europe to understand Germany's nuclear capabilities. They were planning to build a bomb. The famous OSS operatives, Julia Child, and uh, she was a spy who helped develop shock repellent, um, a recipe for shock repellent. John Ford, the famous director, Marlena Dietrich, who was an operative, Stephanie Rader, who was a translator, and naturally Alan Dulles, who was the ocean, OSS station chief in Switzerland. So the OSS kind of recruited a lot of famous people. But it was the Nazi war machine that scared the living bejesus out of everybody. And the United States needed to find out if the Nazis had the capability 
to build a nuclear weapon. Now, the United States had already engaged in the Manhattan Project, and you're familiar with the Manhattan Project, which is the creation of, um, of the nuclear bomb. And the big question is, are the Germans close to building it and who's involved? And this would be Berg's assignment. Berg's target would be the 42-year-old German physicist, Werner Heisenberg, who won the Nobel Prize in 1932 for quantum mechanics. Now, there were, Heisenberg was considered, next to Einstein, one of the brilliant minds of, uh, of the 20th century. And a lot of the Italian uh, and French and, and German scientists had left. A lot ended up in the shores of the United States. Excuse me. And there's conflicting reports. Is Heisenberg building a bomb? But the conflicting reports was he's loyal to Germany. He's pro-German, but not pro-Nazi. And how do you distinguish the two? And that was the big issue. Berg gets his assignment to chase down Heisenberg. And, and, and Donovan, with others, trained Berg. And Berg needs to get to Heisenberg. And Donovan tells him, point blank, that um, you will know you will know um, whether they're about to build a bomb or not. And you'll have to make that decision. And Berg's assignment continues to change. Is he there to kill him? Or not? Is he there to kidnap him and bring him to the United States? And Mo Berg, if need be, can you kill a man? Can you kill Eisenberg? Berg's code name was, was Remus. And Berg needed to find out which German and Italian scientists were alive and where, what were their travel plans, learn about all you can about secret German weapons, recognize the words atomic bomb in our radioactive in papers and presentations, be on the lookout for recently constructed industrial complexes, and get a status on rare material metals still available in um, in Europe. And many in, in the Heisenberg circle, the circle of scientists, believed that Heisenberg was capable of building that nuclear reaction, of building the atomic bomb. But they also believed that he wouldn't do that that he wouldn't put that into the hands of a madman. And that goes back to this conflict. He's pro-German, but not pro-Nazi. So with a 45 government issue pistol and about $2,000 in OSS funds, Berg is, is dropped into occupied Europe. And he's on following the trail of Eisenberg to Zurich, where the scientists he finds out will be speaking. And, and remember, ladies and gentlemen, that Berg is in a war zone. He's placing himself in danger every day. Now, he's got training. He's got some, some military training, not to the extent other soldiers have, but he has some. He's a good athlete. But when you're a spy in a war zone, you can't trust anybody. And Berg always has to ask himself, who else is watching Eisenberg? Is Eisenberg being a target? Am I being watched? Am I a target? And the Berg story really is being placed in Casablanca and the Third Man, those two famous movies. Trust no one. Trust absolutely no one. Danger surrounds you. Danger is around every corner. And it's Mo Berg who is the main character in this deadly game. The second string character, second string catcher for the Boston Red Sox who's been given a license to kill, is the main character in this very deadly game. But where is Heisenberg? And Berg needs to present himself as a real student of nu nuclear physics. He needs to study 
and read all that he could do and talk to the scientists about not only Heisenberg, but all that he could find out about nuclear reaction. He needs to seem convincing. Then he would technically survive and remain unnoticed because he could pull, pour, pull himself off as a suicide, su uh, as a student. Because if he didn't, it's a suicide mission. He'd be found out and he would be killed. And he would just be another name on a wall somewhere. Berg has to track Heisenberg's move without being noticed. And don't forget, Berg was also, sorry, uh, Eisenberg was also being followed by the Nazis, the Gestapo, and uh, in British intelligence. And when we talk about Donovan, when Donovan peppers Berg with questions, particularly about can you um, kill a man? He also gives him a cyanide pill and tells him you cannot be captured. By all means, there is no way that you can be captured. So he's carrying a cyanide, he's not only carrying his pistol, but he's carrying his cyanide pit, the cyanide pill in his pocket at all times. He can't be found. So Berg tracks down. Eisenberg goes to Zurich, listens to a presentation, gets a chance meeting with Eisenberg, and Eisenberg's presentation and statements, according to Berg, made it very clear that Germany was not even close to, to building a, um, an atomic bomb. And then it later was found out that it was in that Germany was never even close to building that. Now, I, mean, I just, it's hard to imagine that a person who's not formally trained in being a spy is given this top secret mission to find out if the greatest enemy to man's survival is creating the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. And that's put on Berg's shoulders. So Berg not only had to keep his fake identity up as a spy, you know, watch over and turn, turn over his shoulder every minute to see who was watching him, couldn't be captured, possibly had to kill a man that he never knew, never done before but have to maybe kill himself if he was captured. He's been given a license to kill. And it's his call. He's gonna be put into a situation where it's his call as to whether Germany is gonna, has the capability of building an atomic bomb or not. So in all the different stresses you have on yourself, the fate of man's survival is on Berg's shoulders. And think about if he made the wrong decision, how different history would have been. It's just an amazing, amazing story for a backup catcher for the Boston Red Sox. Berg has, um, why isn't his story told that familiar? Well, you know, he's a spy. He kept secrets. He knew how to keep secrets. So when they would see him, when people who knew him would see him in the streets, well, hey, what are you doing? He would put his his finger up to his mouth, like, Shh, you didn't see me, I'm not here. Was, what, was Mo Berg a war hero? Absolutely. But he's also baseball's probably biggest enigma. And what happened to him? You know, with all his successes after World War II, he, he's really adrift. You know, at the conclusion of World War II, he's in Europe trying to keep European scientists from going to Russia. He's been tasked with finding possible atomic stockpiles, hot water, uranium, and whatever countries were pursuing atomic energy like Germany, Switzerland, and France. Eventually he resigned from the OSS in 45. He did some work for the CIA in, in the 50s, early 50s. And he actually interviewed um, 
Anna Anderson, who claimed that she was uh, the famous Princess Anastasia, the youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas from Russia, who supposedly was killed with the family during the Bolshevik Revolution. And Berg was the first to say, she's a fraud. She's not who she says she is. Berg never married, never held a steady job, never had money. Um, he lived with his older brother for a while, who was a doctor, and then ended up living with his sister, who was a teacher. Um, Berg sat alone at many baseball games as a former, as a retired Major League Baseball player. He had a lifetime pass to both the National and American League Baseball games, and he would go. Um, he knew how to catch a free lunch and would go to the uh, columnist lunch during um, during the, you know, at the beginning of the game, grab a couple of free meal, grab a free meal, throw some sandwiches into his pocket, sit there, talk to the columnist, and then watch a baseball game. And he just had a trip. Never had a long-term relationship. He had a great love in Estella Hooney, who was a music teacher, a piano player in New York. They had a torrid love affair, but once he left for World War II, she ended up getting married and having children. Um, so there's really no female companion or any relationship to talk to, and that's pretty sad, particularly when we talk about World War II. And then in this war, every, every family was involved in one way or another. And, you know, these, these people, these veterans had, had seen so many, um, the worst in human nature. You know, they sought to, when they came home, they sought to make, um, to make the world a better place. And actually these photos are members of my family who um, served in, the, uh, in World War II and the young man at the very bottom uh, with the black hair and the, the Navy suit, the white Navy sailor's outfit is my grandfather, Thomas Piscato, um, who was 31 when he joined the service. So, you know, men and women just wanted a sense of normalcy and I don't believe Mo Berg had that. Mo Berg just ended up being one of the guys. And he left, really led, led a nomadic life after World War II. Um, you see him at baseball games, scoring a free meal, um, didn't divulge most of himself to anybody, including his family, and just always remained an enigma. And, and you feel bad because, I feel bad because he seems like to be the loneliest man on the face of the earth. Um, you know, his, his brother would complain about the stockpile of newspapers that were building up. He was like a hoarder that he didn't read or he was going to get to read. Um, people would buy him new suits because uh, he just didn't have any money. They would loan him money. And uh, in, in David Dobbs book, some of my friends said that no one knew how to secure a free meal better than Mo Berg. Um, Berg died in, in May of 1972 at the age of 70 from industry, uh, injury sustained in a fall at home. And if, if, you, look, if you look at the, his obituary, um, there's not much there. He would look just like any other uh, typical baseball player. Nothing special about the man. And that's a shame because there was so much more than met the eye. And, and today, rightfully so, Berg is a children's story, not just a baseball player, but an American hero. And the Mo Berg myth is, has become a legend. You have the great book that I mentioned, D David Oss book, and uh, the movie. And within the last 20 years, the Berg story has really garnered a lot of attention. And uh, the 2017 film, The Catcher Was a Spy, stars Ant-Man himself, Paul Rudd. And, you know, Berg's love life with women could be described as superficial and confusing. And, and, and it's just, again, his loneliness. There's no one really to speak of. And um, he didn't have a good relationship with his dad. His dad never saw him play baseball. Ted Williams' family never saw him play, saw them play baseball. Actually, Ty Cobb's family never saw them play, saw him play baseball. And, um, and this is telling about a man who had a real difficulty in sustaining long, healthy relationships. So everyone has some type of issue that they're dealing with. And, um, you know, 
Berg just drifted. He was offered a job by his old teammate and friend, Ted Lyons of the, of the White Sox. Tom Yockey, the owner of the Boston Red Sox, offered him a job and he, he turned both of them down. He lived with various people who gave him money, food, took, took him on family vacations, bought him suits at Brooks Brothers. Um, and he was never really offended by being known as the perpetual guest. Um, you know, and then I guess what it encapsulates his life, which is that he had reached out to someone to write his autobiography. And when the person came to interview Bo Berg, the publisher dropped the idea because they thought they were interviewing Mo Howard of the Three Stooges fame. Who wants to know about a Mo Berg? And no one knows who Mo Berg is. He's just another washed up baseball player. So talking about a crushing defeat late in life. Berg's cremate, uh, cremated remains were spread over Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, and even that's a mystery. When he had died, he was, his, his remains were buried. His sister dug them up, flew to Israel, and, and spread them over Mount Scopus in, in Jerusalem in Israel. Um, according to Jonathan Mark, the New York Jewish Week, to hear people, men and women, tell, Berg is likely the most mysterious, intellectual, bravest, sexiest, and in the end, perhaps the loneliest man of his time. Ask him about his secrets, and he just smile, put his index fingers to his lips and go, shh, spies and gentlemen don't talk. And like all good spies, even to this day, Moberg remains elusive to us. He was posthumously um, awarded the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom, which in his lifetime, he, was, he refused it because he was embarrassed. Um, he was inducted in 1996 into the Berg, into the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. In 2000, he was inducted into baseball's reliquary shrine of the Eternals. And he is the only baseball card, only baseball card um, to have a display in the CIA. In his last words uh, in the Bellevue, New Jersey hospital, his last words to his um, nurse was, how did the Mets do today? So his last thoughts were not about his brother and sister. It wasn't about his great love, Estella Looney. Looney. It was about baseball. So in the end, this is a baseball story. Well, Berg is a true American hero. And um, I found his story to be fantastical, too fantastical to believe. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope you do a little research on your own about Moberg because it truly is an amazing story. And that concludes my, um, my presentation. Jen? Do you want to open it up to questions? Um, sure. You kind of have to read Folks, if you want to unmute yourselves and ask a question, feel free. Um, I have one. Um, how accurate do you think the movie was? Um, well, I mean, I think with any, any movie, you, you get us put in a lot of information and actions into a short time frame. So the movie was pretty accurate on a lot of aspects of it. Um, they got Joe Cronin's number wrong in the back of his uniform, which I thought was hilarious. They used, actually, they used Johnny Pesky's number six. Cronin did wear number six. Um, he wore number four. But um, I thought a lot of it, you know, again, when, you, when you're dealing with the movie, I thought a lot of it was good, um, particularly about the, you know, trying to touch, you know, chase down Eisenberg, and they have to take liberty, right? So a couple of names would be different. They're trying to get all of this Berg story into a two hour movie. I like the movie, I've watched it over and over again. I thought Paul Rudd was the perfect actor for it. And um, hey, it's a Red Sox story. If this, if this guy played for the Yankees, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking about it. Comment here in the no. chat, can you see it? Just bravo and thank you, Anthony. Appreciate the exciting journey you led thank us you. through. Thank you very much. For, it's thank it's you, from Derek. Derek. <laughs> okay. No questions? Any memories of Mo Berg? Anybody see him play? I think it's fascinating that, you know, he played with all these great baseball players, but you know, his he loved he loved Boston. Boston was his favorite city. And that and that makes sense because it it attracts to his intellectual pursuits. 
so the universities and colleges, museums and the libraries, and, you know, and the restaurants. And Boston does have this European tinge to it, particularly back during the time that Berg was playing. So uh, it makes sense that he would find a real great home here in, uh, in Boston during his playing days. much for for joining us again <laughs> this is i think your sixth fifth or sixth time yeah um enlightening us on baseball and history now. yeah i so, mean we gotta, we gotta yes. say something good about the red sox right <laughs> well excellent well thank you everybody for coming um so sandra says thank you very interesting um and david says thank you and thank you anthony never knew any of this thank you so it's a fascinating story. No, oh, terrific. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have thank a wonderful you. night and happy thank holiday season to you all. Thank you. Anthony will be back probably in the spring, I, I think, think so. right? I'll talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.